Good morning, church family. Welcome to Troy Seventh Day Adventist Online Church. Together while we're apart, it is good to be together. My name is Pastor Travis Smith. I am the senior pastor of Troy Seventh Day Adventist Church. And right now, we're going to go right to our opening prayer. Please bow your heads with me for the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for a chance to come and meet together. Even though we're separated and we're in our own homes, thank you that we can get together still and worship with you online. I ask that you please be with each of the viewers. Please send your Holy Spirit to them. Teach them what you would like them to be taught. And I ask that you please just continue to take care of us. You know what each person is struggling with. Please give us strength for what we need to deal with in our lives. I thank you again for being with us this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. Our first song will be Great is Thy Faithfulness. So please join me in singing this song. One, two, three. children's story. <laughs>
Today's message is we worship God when we have faith in Him. Have your parents ever asked you to do something that you didn't want to do? Maybe you couldn't understand why they wanted you to do it. But you obeyed them because you have faith in them. You believe they want what's best for you. Something like that happened to the Israelites. Let's read more. God's people had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. The Israelites had once been on the edge of the promised land. But because they chose to disobey God and not believe him, they wandered through the wilderness. But he didn't abandon them. Every day of those 40 years, they had manna to eat. They had water to drink. Now, once again, the Israelites were near the promised land. So near, they could see the cool valleys and green fields. And they thought it was unfair that they had spent 40 years in the desert. They grumbled to one another. Then they began to grumble to Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? They complained. There's no water. There's no bread. And we're tired of eating manna. They did not appreciate what God had done to keep them safe. They weren't happy about spending all that time in the hot, dusty desert learning more about God and knowing his ways are always good. Once again, they accused God of causing their hardships. Poor Moses. He had heard it all before. He tried to point out God's leading. He tried to show them the many ways God had cared for them, but they wouldn't listen. It seemed that all they could do was complain. Finally, God decided to take away his protection and let them see what would happen. The poisonous snakes that lived in the desert soon overran the camp, and many of the Israelites were bitten. In almost every tent, someone was dead or dying. No one was safe from the fiery snake venom. Once bitten, they soon died. It didn't take the people long to see how wrong they had been. We sinned when we grumbled against you and God, they told Moses. Please, they begged, pray that God will take away the snakes. Moses prayed, and the Lord heard him. God told him to make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. If those who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake, they would live. Moses made the snake just as he was told, and the people who looked at it were healed by God. But some people did not have faith in God. They chose not to follow his directions, not to look at the pole. Because they did not obey, God could not heal them, so they died. The snake in the desert was a symbol of Jesus dying for our sins. The metal snake itself had no power to heal. It was faith in God that led him to heal them. Years later, Jesus referred to his own death. The Bible tells us what he said. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, who is Jesus, must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Our faith in Jesus, lifted up on the cross, helps us know that Jesus died so we can live with him forever. So have faith in God and believe what the Bible says. All right, thank you. It's time to go to our Michigan Conference President's video. Greetings, Michigan Conference family. Like a current, COVID-19 has changed aspects of our lives at home, church, school, and government. It's taught us many things, including how swiftly things can change. In some cases, the changes have been drastic. Other times, the current has been as powerful as it is subtle. I'm struck by how unavoidable and present change is. Government, science, and medicine continue to make adjustments. Important meetings of the past don't seem as important today. Our definition of church has shifted. Through change, we've become a different nation, a different world, and hopefully a better church. 
I believe God will make the best out of the recent changes. I also believe His ultimate purpose is to help us to become more like Him. It's been my goal to use this weekly address to also share the good things that are taking place in our territory, hopefully to encourage you. This week, our conference staff collected and distributed over 6,000 pounds of food in Grand Rapids to support the displaced families from Burma and Rwanda. To help families affected by the Midland floods, various departments partnered together with state and federal agencies to provide necessary items for people in need. These opportunities provide temporal support for victims and produces long-term effects on those serving. With camp meeting canceled, we had planned to hold a conference-wide week of prayer with members gathering in their local churches. But with the extended stay-at-home directive, many churches will not be ready for in-person meetings. Though we can't replace the camp meeting experience, in two weeks, the Michigan Conference will partner with the Village Church in Berrien Springs to conduct a virtual camp meeting. There will be morning and evening plenary sessions, seminars, and programming for children and youth. The theme will be Forward to the Finish. Details will be shared through various ways on how to participate, and we invite you to join us. In reflecting on the change of course caused by the pandemic, I'm reminded of God's faithful presence. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yet, His mercies are new every morning. In the tides of change, He is the unmovable rock that provides safety and assurance. Yet, there is a beautiful mystery that takes place at the center of God's interaction with you and me. Through the pandemic of sin, Satan tried to separate us from God permanently. But instead, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. By adopting our likeness, God has made it possible for us to adopt His. And my prayer is that we will let God use even this pandemic to transform our characters. Let me share this Bible promise with you from Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that He who has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. God bless you, and happy Sabbath. All right, thank you, Alder. It's really good to have those weekly updates. It's now time for announcements. We have Dr. Wendell's Zoom class um, on Sabbath morning at 9.30. Terry Morgan also has a Sabbath school class. If you would like information on that, um, feel free to contact her. You should get an email about... Uh, Dr. Wendell's Sabbath School class inviting you. Um, we have a Zoom church board meeting Sunday, June 14 at 10 a.m. And the topic is going to be um, when will we reopen church? I absolutely have no idea when we're going to reopen church. And um, it seems that we're just all in the river of the coronavirus and we have no paddles and the, the virus will decide when we open up and when the, the, the cases go down and the deaths go down and we all feel that it's safe and reasonable to, to open, that's when we will open. So I will make a Zoom link and email it to the board uh, members. And so again, that's Sunday, June 14 at 10 a.m. And of course, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we are moving along with our midweek Bible study. And, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And then next Sabbath, we are going back to streaming, live stream at 11 a.m. Okay, so at 11 a.m., we will be back in the church this coming Sabbath um, next week. That will be the first Sabbath in June. Okay, now we have midweek Bible study. We finished um, ch chapter 19. And we're ready to begin chapter 20, which is called The Great Controversy Ended. And as always, I want to encourage you to be faithful in your tithes and offerings during this time. I know I just returned mine um, today as I got paid last night. Praise the Lord for those paychecks. And I just pray that all of you are doing well financially and 
and that the Lord is blessing you there as you are uh, faithful in your tithe and offerings. Um, if any of our church members have any real needs at this time, please feel free to contact with me as we have um, money in um, our church our church um, membership assistance to help in an extreme case. So contact me if you if you need anything there. And if you just want to call and talk, call me. Text me. Let me know how you're how you're doing. We reach out to a lot of people. But if you just need to talk or you just want to vent because you're angry or you're frustrated about everything that's going on, go ahead and call me and we'll talk and I'll give you an ear to listen to. Uh, now, let's go to our message for this morning. It's called Jesus, the Great Storyteller. Bow your heads with me as I pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we have to study your word. We pray that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Last time we were together... We saw that the ministry of Jesus caused some problems for the family of, of, of Jesus' immediate family. Uh, the brothers and his mother came looking for him because they were bringing a reproach upon the family. And the brothers and the sisters wanted to basically uh, carry Jesus away so that he wouldn't stop making, so he would stop making a fool of himself and bring a reproach upon the family. We learned that. His brothers and his family didn't even believe in him. I'm sure his mother did, but the brothers um, later became Bible authors. Judas wrote Jude, and James, Judas obviously not Iscariot, but Judas wrote Jude, and James wrote James. And we see from the book of Acts and other sources in the Bible that it was probably James who was the leader of the New Testament church. It seems that everything in in the book of Acts and in the uh, Pauline letters, things went through James. And also we saw last week that Jesus redefined what true family is. Mark 3.31, the Bible says, Then his brothers and his mother came, standing outside. They went to him, calling him, and a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. As we saw earlier, they were not coming because of enthusiasm, they were coming to talk sense to him. So the Mark chapter 3 version of the brothers of Jesus are far from being followers of Jesus. At this point, they thought that Jesus was going insane and they were coming to tell him that he, that he was making a fool of himself and bringing reproach upon the family's name. Here is when Jesus redefines what family really is. Mark 3 verse 33. Then he answered and said to them, who is my mother or my brothers? Jesus continues on in verse 35, verse 34. He looked around in a circle and sat at, at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. The author of the book of Hebrews confirms this idea that the, your, your brothers and sisters in the church are sometimes closer to you than your actual family. Um, the author of the book of Hebrews says in the NIV version, Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So then those who do the will of God are your family in Christ. All right, now let's move on to chapter 4. Let's read Mark chapter 4, 1 through 9. Mark chapter 4, 1 through 9. And again, he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea, then he taught them many things by parables, and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. Verse 6. 
But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. By this time, the popularity of Jesus was becoming very great that a synagogue was not enough, did not provide enough room for all the people who wanted to hear Jesus speak. And so Jesus decided that the, the sea or the lakeside would be a better place. This is why we find Jesus teaching by the water. Mark 4 verse 1, let's go through it together. And again, he began to teach by the sea. So he had um, not only a pervert, a preferred venue for teaching, he also had a way that he wanted to teach them. And it says that a great multitude was gathered to him, that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. So Jesus had a preferred venue, which was outside in the open air, and he also had a way that he preferred to teach, and this was by parables. Mark 4, verse 2. Then he taught them many things by what? Parables. And said to them in his teaching, you know, um, as opposition to Jesus increased, Jesus began to use parables more. We see that in the first three chapters of, of the book of Mark, Jesus faced nothing but conflict. It was constant conflict, whether it was from his family, as we saw, the scribes of the Pharisees, um, uh, unbelief, the crowd. We saw that there was demons and Satan oppressing him at every step. Okay, so this, this chapter in Mark features the most parables. However, Mark uses fewer parables than, than Matthew and Luke because Mark speeds his gospel right, right along. But in the context of what has happened so far in the book of Mark, Jesus has had nothing but conflict with, with um, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, Satan and demons, etc. So he reverts to parables to teach. Did you know that the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would teach with parables? Turning your Bibles to Psalm 78. Where are we going? Psalms 78. And verse 2, Psalms 78 and verse 2, Psalm 78 and verse 2. Give you just a second to get there, Psalm 78 and verse 2. I'll give myself just a second to get there. All right, Psalms 78 and verse 2. Speaking of the Messiah, David wrote, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Now let's compare this scripture with Matthew 13, 34. Go to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 34. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30, 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them. Watch this. That it might be fulfilled by which was spoken by the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Here, um, Matthew is quoting from the Septuagint version. That's why it's just a little bit different than the uh, original Hebrew. And you know that the Septuagint version is the Greek Old Testament. And so it's just a little bit different because words don't transfer um, right into from Greek to Hebrew. So it's just a little bit different. But here, Matthew cites Jesus quoting Psalm 78, verse 2, in fulfillment of prophecy. This is really interesting stuff. So why did Jesus use parables in the first place? Parables were a safe way for Jesus to speak. They were interest grabbers. They made truth concrete. They enabled the hearers to rethink the lessons as they went about their daily business. They helped individuals discover the truth for themselves. And also... Parables were, were ways to conceal things from people that weren't ready to receive it openly, okay? In other words, 
the Bible says that seeing they may see and hearing they may they, they may hear. And the the people who were interested in knowing truth, Jesus spoke plainly to, to them. But in order to conceal truth, sometimes Jesus um, used parables so that his enemies wouldn't use his lessons against him and thus make more trouble for him. This is basically what Jesus said in Mark 4, verse 10 and 12. Let's go back to Mark chapter 4. So turn in your Bibles and go to Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about this parable, and he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside all things come in parables, that seeing they may see and he and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Okay? So notice this from Mark Strauss from the Zondervan Mark on um, commentary um, by Mark Strauss. The central theme of the parable of the sower is the need to hear and respond to the good news of the kingdom. So there you have it. That's the re purpose for the parable of the sower. But the purpose for parables, he talks about right here. The purpose for parables is both to re review and to conceal. Okay? It's both to reveal and to conceal. The, to those who open to the kingdom proclamation, the parables reveal the truth, but for the hard-hearted people, the parables blind them further. In this way, God accomplishes his sovereign purposes, even through the opposition and hard-heartedness of sinful people. So there you have it. The purpose of parables is both to reveal and to conceal. That's very interesting. So we move on to verse 3. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Jesus begins to explain his parable in verse 14. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown, into their hearts. So the sower basically is God and the seed is scripture. It's it's the word of God, right? Then there's four types of soil that the, the seed is implanted. There's the wayside, there's the stony ground, there's the thorns, and then there is the good seed. So the soil has the seed going into it. The seed is the word of God. The soil represents the heart and the mind. It's the heart of the person. So notice as we go through the parable that the sowing for all categories of, of, of people are the same. God brings the word. So you can try to reach people through any modern method, but Jesus' preferred way and only way of reaching the, the lost was through the word. Now granted, you can use many modern ways, to get people to become interested in God. But make no mistake, conversion only happens by the preaching and hearing of the word. Amen. So, all four types of person hear the word, but all have different responses. In other words, all four categories are potential disciples. Moving along. Here are the wayside ground, ground hearers. This picture of a seed being thrown onto hard soil. This is a picture of seed being thrown onto hard soil. And since the soil represents a person's heart, it means that the person's heart is hard. Okay? So the ground is hard in, in the parable, and that represents the person's heart being hard. These people have heard the truth, but had developed all kinds of reasons why they cannot give themselves to God. They have a hard exterior of emotional and intellectual excuses why they do not totally follow Jesus. Maybe it's they don't want to give up friends, the, that, that habit, that job because it's too worldly that takes your mind to Jesus, but it pays well and they don't want to get it, let, let it go. Or maybe it's that career that you've, that you've always wanted or that boy 
or that girl that you have never prayed about but done your own thing, thinking that this was the, 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 the one for you, but never prayed about the job, never prayed about the boy or the girl. Friends, we want to let God lead our lives because he can make us happy more than, more than we can. And maybe you're afraid that if you give yourself to God, that he will ask you to do things that you don't want to do. These are wayside hearers. They hear and then they go away. What about the stony ground hearers? Mark 4 verse 5, some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Jesus explains this in verse 16. Likewise, these are the ones sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So when they hear the scriptures, when they hear the truth, they're fired up, right? They want to go tell people about it, and they receive it with joy. But verse 17, and they have no root in themselves. In other words, they're brand new Christians, and perhaps this indicts a little bit of the church because people tend to keep to themselves in the church. This is the sad fact of reality. Uh, people assume that everyone else will disciple new, new believers, okay? And they expect the pastor and the elders to do all the discipling and expect that everyone else in the church will take care of them. Friends, what has God called you to do? What has God called you to reach out to the people that are new in the church? Don't expect everyone else to do the discipling and make friends with these people. God has called you. If you have been baptized, if you are a disciple of Christ, it is your responsibility to reach out to the lost and to new people in, in the church as well. So it doesn't matter how long you've been in the church, no one is off the hook. And, and there's not really a hook. I delight to do thy will, O Lord, thy law is within my heart. If you have Jesus in your heart, it is a delight to do what God wants us to do. And sharing your faith and, and befriending people for the sake of Christ will not be a job. It'll be natural. So if you don't feel any type of, any type of need to share your faith, pray that God converts your heart. Okay? So these people, the Stony Ground hearers, the Word of God is not the controlling force in their life. As a result, when trouble comes... They fade away like a plant without a root that has not fell into the ground yet. Now we go to the thorny ground hearers. Let's summarize the stony ground hearers before we go to the thorny ground. Stony ground hearers are eager learners but fall away when hard times come. The effort to serve, Ellen White says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 50, the effort to serve both self and Christ makes one a stony ground hearer and he will not endure when the test comes upon him. Okay, So we want to be totally sold out to Jesus. We want to be studying and praying every single day and asking God to bring people in our path that we can bless. If these people would trust that when hard times come, Jesus will see them through and they will make it. Like right now, hard times are on us, but God will see us through. Amen. The early church went through some hard times of persecution, persecution, and this particular part of the parable particularly spoke to the early church who was dealing with persecution. This is a appeal to Mark to stick with Jesus through persecution. And I suppose that like we learned last week, or the last time we were together, um, Brandon Bryant did a wonderful job last week, but the time before that, we saw that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul tells us that in the book of 2 Th Timothy. So I guess what is important to learn here is the concept of the why and the what. What's that? Well, here it is. If you know the why, then you can deal with the what. If you know why you're doing something, if it gets challenging, you can stick through it, like getting a degree. So the tests are hard, the papers are long, the professor is stone boring, but you stick with the class because you know your end goal is to get a degree 
so that you can get a job and provide for yourself and for your family. So if you know why you're in that boring class, you can stick with it and you can continue on because you're in it for the what. You're in it for the why, not just for the what. And a lot of times people have something hard come upon them and they're doing something and they quit. Friends, God's people are not quitters. God's people are determined individuals that make a plan. They pray and they ask God to lead, lead their life, not leave their life, lead their life. And they believe that they're being led by God. And so there's a determination to finish what you start because you believe that God is leading your life. And you're doing this because it fulfills God's purpose for your life. So when you, we start something and we quit, I'm guessing that we have not discovered God's ultimate plan for our life. And that's why we need to be on our knees every day asking God, Lord, reveal to me what it is that you want me to do. Now we go into the stony, the thorny ground hearers. Mark 4, verse 7. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And they yielded no crop. Right? They choked it out, and it yielded no crop. Jesus picks up his explanation in verse 18. Hey, we try to have a little fun when we preach here. Amen? We're, we're, we're Christians. We're not dead. Somebody can say amen. Mark 4, verse 18. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now here, I can really identify with this group of people. Okay, These people are living a, a life that is just too busy and they're just trying to fit too much in, okay? And our 21st century society does not help. Today, we're in love with stuff. We love things. We love to, to go out and buy and fill up our homes and our garages with stuff. Even they had shows called Hoarders. And I remember moving somebody in Oregon and their home was just filled with stuff. And we went to the we went to the garage, and the guy told us, "Go ahead and throw away what you what you think is junk, and we'll we'll just throw it away, and we won't move it to the new house." Well, I opened that garage, and it was filled from side to side, from floor to ceiling, with junk. I have no idea how that man packed all that stuff into this into this um, garage. This friends, this story I'm telling you about. I need some of my other friends who actually were there for you to understand what, what really, how bad this house was. These people were hoarders. And I started throwing everything away. And the guy came out, whoa, this isn't junk. You can't throw that away. And then he started telling me the story about this particular item. And I'm like, sir, we need to throw this stuff away because... This man is trying to move into his house and you are late and you're being charged every day because you're not, you're not out of the house. And then he went into this big spiel about how all this stuff was, was just so important. It was junk. And we hoard up stuff and we think that things are so important. And friends, listen, the same goes for money for anything that you are so focused on to the exclusion of your relationship with Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24, write it down and check it. No one can serve two ma masters, okay? Nobody can serve the master and master card. This is why we're constantly thinking about trying to get out of debt, right? But we can think about getting out of debt so much that we forget about serving God, right? And so one of my favorite statements from... A, a, a man named Roger Kuhn, which was a professor at Andrews some years ago, he said the goal of Christianity is to achieve balance and, is, and to dis avoid distortion. The goal of Christianity is to achieve balance and to avoid distortion. Oh, that we would be in the middle path, not way over on the left or way over on the right. Oh, that we would be right in the middle road where the word of God can speak to us and we can remain focused on God. Now we go to the good ground hearers. 
Just before we go to the good ground hairs, let's summarize the thorny ground hairs. This picture of a seed being thrown into the soil that is so overrun with thorns, they choke the word. These people have a high regard for truth. They appreciate it. They believe it. But they, they will get to it, the truth, after all of their other pursuits have been filled. I would say that based upon what I see in the church today as a pastor for 12 years, um, this is where most church people are. Not necessarily in the Seventh-day Adventist church, churched in general, the whole world. This is mostly where people are. We're in the church of Laodicea, right? How do I know? Because in every church that I have belonged to from my youth till now, 20% of the people does 80 to 100% of the work. And you have a core group of people who literally do everything that love God's word and love God's cause that can't stand to see things not getting done that they do two or three, four people's jobs. Friends, where are the people who are willing to be used for God? Where are the people who are willing to spend and be spent? Where are the people who are willing to be connected with the work of God? Friends, I invite you, if you have not transferred your membership and you are a regular uh, person who comes to Troy week in and week out to please transfer your membership so that you can have an official church position so that you can be a contributor. Now, I understand that some people who, who don't have their membership are contributors, but on a... On a, on a deeper level and in an official capacity, we invite you to transfer your membership to Troy so that we can get you going this coming nominating committee. Amen? Amen. All right. So, what about the good ground hearers? Mark 4, verse 8, But the other seed fell on good ground and yielded up a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Jesus says in verse 20, which is very similar to verse 8, but these are the, these ones are the sown on good ground. Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Now, unfortunately, this group of hearers, the good ground hearers, are the minority of the church. Here, Jesus paints the picture of a true disciple. They hear the word, they accept the word, and they bear fruit. They hear the word, they accept the word, and they bear fruit. Now, what does it mean to bear fruit? Let's do a little Bible study on the screen about what it means to bear fruit. Isaiah 27, verse 6. Read it with me on the screen. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel, the church, shall blossom in bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Ezekiel 17, verse 23. And the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it, and it will bring forth boz and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. This was God's plan for his, for his people Israel. Then we move into the New Testament. John 15, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you what? Bear much fruit, so that you will be what? My disciple. So disciples bear fruit. Church members have leaves on their, on their tree, but disciples bear fruit. Verse 16, same chapter. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Jesus wants us to be fruit bearers. And then, of course, Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Watch the natural progression. It all starts with love. The Word of God is about God's love. Okay, And that love being imparted and downloaded and installed into the heart of man so that their motives and the reason that they do things are pure for God's kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then when you have love, you have joy. And if you have joy, you have peace. And if you have peace, you can deal with knuckleheads in the church and outside. You have long-suffering. You Then, when you have long-suffering, you can be kind to people. And then that kindness produces goodness, and goodness produces faithfulness. A marathon, not a sprint, 
That's what faithfulness is. It's running a marathon with God's power. Okay? And then, when you're faithful, you can be gentle. And when you have gentleness, you have self-control. There's a natural progression with these fruits of the Spirit. It's not just a list just haphazardly listed by, by Paul there. Everything makes sense. It builds on each other there. Against such, there is no law. Or in other words, there's nothing against the Bible that will speak against these things. Okay? So, who should have the fruits of the Spirit? Every Christian should have the fruits of the Spirit. Not every Christian has all the gifts of the Spirit because not everyone is called by the Holy Spirit to minister in the same way. But every single church member should have the fruits of the Spirit. In Scripture, bearing fruit simply means to have spiritual growth. Okay, there's a lot more verses that I could have put up on the board, like Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, the parable of uh, the vineyard, that also comes to mind. But bearing fruit simply means to grow spiritually. And in some cases, this means winning souls to Jesus, bringing them to the baptistry. And in other places, it simply represents spiritual growth. Okay, Christ's Abek Lessons, page 60, it says, The Word of God often comes in collision with man's hereditary and cultivated traits of character and his habits of life. These are the good ground here. But the good ground here in receiving the Word accepts all its conditions and requirements. His habits, customs, and practices are brought into submission to God's Word. And again, that's Christ's Abek Lessons, page 60. And so, they might have habits, but the Word of God says, don't do this or do that, and they surrender their habits to the Lord, and then the Lord is able, by His Spirit, to bring their character under submission to God's will, and the rough man becomes sweet. The violent man becomes kind. You get the point, okay? God wants to change us from what we are to what He is like. So here are the key lessons that we have seen from the parable of the sower. The disciple of Christ needs to be deep students of the Word of God. Each group has a, has a main lesson, okay? The wayside gr um, ground hearers, are, the lesson from that is that we are supposed to be deep students of the Word of God because these heard the Word and they didn't have any depth to them and they went away. So the wayside here group tells us that we need to become deep students of the Word of God. And I'm not talking about just hearing some five-minute podcast and thinking that's your worship. I'm talking about actually reading the Word of God. Maybe reading a book about the Bible and reading the Bible with it that explains the passages and the chapters that you're reading, right? Becoming more serious about attending the, the weekly prayer meeting. Friends, we're told in the spirit of prophecy that the pulse of the church is at the prayer meeting. Ours is called at Troy Midweek Bible Study, right? So make it a priority to attend Midweek Bible Study even when we get back together, okay? Stony ground. And you say, well, I work second or third shift. Well, maybe we should have two Midweek Bible Studies, one at like 10 a.m. and one at 7 p.m. Maybe we'll think about doing that. And then we go to the lesson that the stony ground hearers teach us. This is teaches us that there should that the disciple should be a person of perseverance. In this group, when persecution or trouble arises, they left, right? But God tells us that these these stony ground people should be people of perseverance. In other words, they're not running a a sprint, they're running a marathon with the power of the Holy Spirit. Next we go to the lesson of the stony ground hearers. This is the uh, people that live for Christ, not for the world. They have both feet in, in the church and no toes, no feet in the world, right? And so the thorny ground people want both worlds. They want to be in the world and they also want to be in the church. Can't happen. You're either all the way with God or all the way with the devil. 99% God's is is all Satan's, okay? That's, that's the scriptures. That's not Pastor Travis. That's the Bible. And then the last ground, the last ground of group of, of hearers is the good ground. These people are in a state of constant growth because they are bearing fruit. So when a plant stops growing and when a person stops growing, what do they do? They die, 
right? And so the lesson from the good ground here is, is that God's people should always be in a state of constant growth. So what does that mean for our life today? Friend, what kind of hearer are you? Where do you fit in on this list? As you think about it and reflect to yourself, do you find yourself in some times of your life in all four categories, the wayside, the, the stony, then the thorny, then good ground? If you're honest with yourself, you're probably in a little bit of all four of those categories, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's move on into the fourth group where we are good ground here is where we are always in a state of constant growth. Now, I'm going to read something from a commentary that um, I quoted from before because it sums up our lesson really good. It's a little long, so instead of putting it on the board, I'm just going to get it, and I'm going to read it, and then um, my wife will have closing prayer, and we will sing the last song. I'm going to go get it real quick. Probably should have grabbed this book before I began speaking here, but it is this book that you have seen several times and heard from it several times throughout this series. Though Jesus told this parable with special reference to the rejection of his message by Israel's leaders, it has great significance for us today. The same message that Jesus proclaimed, the coming of the kingdom of God and the need to repent and believe, is the message his church proclaims today, and people respond to it in a variety of ways. And these four groups cover those variety of ways. For some, it never gets through and is snatched away by Satan's lies, such as there is no God, or that personal pleasure and fame or wealth is the ultimate goal of life. Or I will add, there is no such thing as absolute truth, which, by the way, is an absolute in and of itself. This postmodern mindset where you're not allowed to say what's right or wrong for anybody. That is a big distraction for today. Um, or that personal pleasure, fame, or wealth is the ultimate goal of life. Or that success comes through personal effort and self-reliance. Those are all deceptions of the devil. For others, the message sounds good and is welcomed with joy, but never penetrates beyond the superficial level of faith. It is based upon emotionalism or is inherited from family, but it has no roots of its own. For these, the church is nothing but a social club. I know I used to have that experience in my 20s. Church was nothing but a social club for me. To meet and develop friendships. The essence of Christianity is being a good person and helping others. This is what people think. Or supporting patriotic American values or a conservative social agenda. Too much of that going on today. Next, it says, the idea of radical commitment to the kingdom and its mission remains an alien concept. So the real reason for being to church is an alien concept. Still others hear the message and are even assimilated into the community of faith, but the distractions of the worlds, the clubs, etc., the excitement, and its worries and its wealth mean that faith never res results into transformation or total conversion. But others respond to the message and persevere until they bear fruit. He has just went through all four categories. Okay, Bearing fruit could mean bringing others to Christ, baptism, but it is much broader than this. It is a life change that results in transformation until we share God's values for the world and develop the mind of Christ. And then he lists Romans 12, um, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, and 17. And then there's one last paragraph. Sometimes the question is raised as to which, if any, of the first three seeds are um, and soils are in fact saved. I'm going to read that again. Sometimes the question is raised as to which, if any, of the first three seeds and soils are in fact saved. But this question misses the point of the parable. All three are unfruitful, and so all have failed. It is not a matter of whether to escape through the flames, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15. Rather, in Jesus' ministry, there are two kinds of people, those who accept the kingdom 
and those who reject it. In other words, the good ground hearers are the only ones who are going to heaven. Okay? The three that failed, um, the three failed seeds represent the latter. True faith produces fruit. Okay? That's the, that's the point of, of the parable. Okay? And so we want to be people in the last and the fourth category that are constantly growing, constantly seeking God's will for their life, being sensitive, praying for God to give you a sensitive ear to his spirit so that you can be led by him. Okay? And this is this is my my prayer for us today that Troy Seventh Day Adventist Church is good or are good ground hearers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word that we've heard this morning. We know our experience, and you know our experience all too well. You look at us with those eyes of fire that see deep into our souls. And you know why we do everything. You know the real reason why we do everything, Lord. And so there's nothing we can hide from you, which means we can be straight, open, and honest with you. Lord, we just pray that we would come to you expecting to be changed, expecting to be blessed, expecting that we would become more like you, that you would not just leave us to try hard on our own to become more like you. No, that you would give us your spirit and we would receive it and be willing to be led. Father, give us repentance. Give us your spirit. We know that we don't repent on our own. It is given to us. And so, Father, we, we pray that you would restore unto us the joy of our salvation and lead us in right paths. Take not your Holy Spirit from us and restore unto us the joy of our salvation, and then we will teach sinners, and transgressors will be turned to your ways. Maybe there is somebody that needs to make that commitment for the first or the 21st time. Maybe you need to have a time with God, and you need to go for a walk this afternoon and think about things and re, re, um, rethink how you're living your life. Um, are you really being led? I think I think you need to ask yourself, is the Spirit of God really leading your life? Let's use this time where we have um, more time at home than usual to think about our spiritual life. Don't let this coronavirus um, stay-at-home ban time go by without coming in close contact with God. Use this time that that we have at home wisely. I know myself, I've read at least seven books. I wrote a book myself, and I'm enjoying doing these studies and reaching out to church members and seeing how everybody's doing. Give somebody a call. Ask them to pray with you and pray for them. We invite you to do that. And I guess I'll conclude my prayer appeal. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to go to our closing hymn, and my wife will lead us in the song, Hymn number 272, Give Me the Bible. Give me the Bible. 100% we need the Bible to grow deeper, just like we were told this afternoon.
Again, we want to thank you for such a powerful sermon. Lord, please bring these lessons, apply them to our hearts. Please help us to reevaluate our lives and the path we, paths we have chosen. And if they are not leading to eternal life, if they are not leading to changing of character, you transforming us, so that we can be ready to meet you again. I pray that you convict us and then give us that strength to make the choices necessary to follow you 100%. Please be with each person who has listened to your words this afternoon. In your name I pray, amen. All right, Carla, thank you for leading that closing song and praying so beautifully. We look forward to seeing you Wednesday night as we study the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, as we conclude our time in the book of Revelation. Until next time, we will see you at the same church time, at the same church channel. Good night, and God bless. <laughs>